So chemists use what's known as the scientific method. It's, it's a way of learning that emphasizes observation and experimentation. It's not a rigid set of rules, do this, 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 and you'll get a result. Um, that would be nice, but it's not how science works. This is very different from um, ancient Greek philosophers who sat around and theorized. Um, they used reason as a way to try to understand the world. And that got them a little bit of, along the way, but it, it only goes so far. So scientific method has four key characteristics, um, observation, formulation of hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, and formulation of laws and theories. And we'll talk about each of those. So here's a, a, a flow chart sort of giving us an overview here. So you have to start somewhere. Usually we start with an observation. From that observation, you make a hypothesis. Um, so you make a hypothesis, and then that needs to be tested. So you do some experiments. Those experiments either confirm your hypothesis or say, no, that was a stupid idea. Um, then you revise your hypothesis and test it again. So you can spend years going around in this little circle. Um, once you have a hypothesis that's been validated, that can be um, established as a scientific law. Um, but those are also subject to testing and um, revisions. A hypothesis can also develop into a theory, and again, theories are tested with experiments. So observation, <coughs> sometimes these involve measurements. Some observations you can make with your, your eyes, your senses. Others need sensitive instruments to make observations of things that we can't detect with our senses. Usually this involves the measurement or description of some aspect of the physical world say, melt, you know, measuring the melting point of a substance. That would involve using a thermometer. An example from history, Antoine Lavoisier lived back in the 1700s. He was interested in how things burn. So most chemists, chemists are secret pyromaniacs. We like to play with fire, right? Fire's fascinating, right? So he was, he was playing with fire. He was burning things, right? But doing them in a scientific way, and so then you don't get into trouble because people think you're trying to burn everything down. So he studied combustion by burning substances in closed containers. So here's a, a picture. Of, he would burn things in a closed container, and then he'd look at the mass before he burned it and the mass after he burned it, and he observed that the mass of the whole container didn't change. And it's different than what you observe, say, in a fireplace. You haul in this big log, right, and you stick it in the fireplace, and maybe some paper and, and small branches to get the fire going, and you have this nice roaring fire back in the day when they actually let us burn things. Um, and then when the fire is all gone, is the log still there? No. There's ashes, right? Are the ashes heavy? No, they're a lot lighter than the log was. So where did all that heaviness go? Well, Lavoisier studied things in a closed container. And in a closed container, the mass doesn't change. And so he observed that, and he's like, OK, that's strange. So then you come up with a tentative explanation for why that is. So the hypothesis, tentative explanation for your observation. An important characteristic of a, a good hypothesis is that it's falsifiable. It could possibly be proven wrong. So then uh, his theory was that combustion involved the combination of a substance with some component of the air. There's more details about this in your textbook. I kind of went off on a, a weird tangent for a while, but then they figured it out. So you have this hypothesis, when something burns, it's combining with something in the air. Well, that's nice, but then you have to test it. Is it true? So an experiment is how we test things. Experiments are highly controlled, and they have a specific purpose to either validate or invalidate your hypothesis. If the experiment shows that the hypothesis is wrong, you may modify it, say, well, let's just change it this little bit, and we'll test it again. 
or we may just throw it out. That was a bad hypothesis. Let's start over. After a revision, the hypothesis has to be tested again. If you have a number of similar observations, that can lead to the development of a scientific law. A law just describes what happens and predicts future observations. It doesn't explain why that's happening. It just says this is what happens. That's also subject to experimental testing. So from his experimentation, Lavoisier developed the law of conservation of mass. And that can be stated as this. In a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. So his experiments support that. You burn something in a closed container, the mass before and after is the same. Now, how it's distributed and what things look like inside the container have changed, but the mass is the same. Nothing was destroyed. Um, hypotheses can also lead to th scientific theories, sometimes called models. These provide an explanation. The law says what happens, the theory explains why that happens. Um, theories can often predict behavior well beyond the original observations on which they were based, and these are also subject to experimental testing. So from Lavoisier's law came John Dalton's atomic theory. Um, and the main principle in that is that all matter is composed of small, indestructible particles called atoms. That explains the law of conservation of mass because if matter is composed of small, indestructible particles, when you burn something, those particles are indestructible. They are still there. So the idea here is that atoms are like Lego bricks. So you've got a whole bunch of Lego bricks and you make something, right? And then you take it apart and you make something else. The Lego bricks are still there. You've just put them together in different ways. And so that's the idea behind the atomic theory. So here's a summary. It's important to understand the difference between a law and a theory. A law just says what happens. So you familiar with the law of gravity? Law of gravity says that if you drop something, it'll fall, right? So if I hold out this pen and I let go of it, law of gravity allows me to predict what's going to happen. What's going to happen? It's going to fall to the floor. Sure enough, it does that every single semester. Law of gravity <clears throat> doesn't explain why that happens. Scientists are still working on that. Haven't gotten to a really satisfying explanation of exactly what gravity is and how it works. But a theory, a theory explains why things happen. A theory is as close to truth as science can get. So in everyday life, you know, Someone says, well, I have a theory about this. And you're like, well, yeah, that's just a theory. That's just your idea. In science, a theory is a very serious thing because it has been tested, and no one has been able to prove it wrong yet. So let's have a little checkpoint here. Which statement most resembles a scientific theory? A, when the pressure on a sample of oxygen gas is increased 10%, the volume of the gas decreases by 10%. Is that a theory? Observation. It's an observation. It's saying this is what happens, but it doesn't try to explain why. Um, B, the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. Does that explain why? No. C, a gas is composed of small particles in constant motion. Well, that doesn't necessarily seem like an explanation. Is this something that can be directly observed? Can you observe the particles in a gas directly with your eyes? No. In the room here, there's air. That's why we're all still alive. And in the air are molecules and atoms of gas, and they're in constant motion. But we can't see that. So I don't expect this to be real obvious to you, but this is the correct answer right here, that a gas is composed of small particles. It's an explanation of why the gas behaves as it does. And letter D, a gas sample has a mass of 15.8 grams, a volume of 10.5 liters. Does that explain anything? 
No, that's just an observation. You've got a gas sample, you can measure its volume and its mass, um, doesn't explain anything. Any questions? So how do we know that atoms are real? Well, now we are able to get um, pictures of atoms. They're very fuzzy. Um, this is an image showing the kanji characters, uh, the Japanese characters representing the word atom, written with individual iron atoms on top of a copper surface. Um, this is done with a scanning tunneling microscope. Um, it's not something you could ever see with um, an optical microscope. Um, but these are individual atoms that be have been moved around um, to form these characters. So that is evidence of atoms.